And we're broadcasting. Participants are coming in. Terrific. Excellent. Lots of people eager. That's great to see. Alrighty, uh, for those of the, you that have joined us for our previous two webinars today, welcome back. You're at the WAGD Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE series. Uh, this is webinar number 35 in our series and we probably have another 20 in us to go here. Uh, appreciate everybody spending their time. Uh, the series, the Stay Home, Stay Healthy series is co-produced uh, by our partners, the University of Washington School of Dentistry, CE, Seattle King County Dental Society, Pierce County Dental Society, Snohomish County Dental Society, and also uh, Comet USA, Patterson Dental, and the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prostodontics. We also have some nice support from the International Academy of Nathology, who's created a series of speakers for uh, next Monday. Uh, that's uh, May 4th, and we've got Bill Robbins starting out the day. So uh, Dr. Fling uses a lot of uh, Dr. Robbins' uh, uh, theories and thoughts in, in his teaching. So that will be a one you will want to sign up for. If you haven't done so, uh, use these QR codes before. That's the way you can register for the upcoming seminars, or you can go to WashingtonAGD.org. Either way will work. From the WashingtonAGD.org uh, website, you can also get on our YouTube channel. And our YouTube channel is Washington Academy of General Dentistry. Uh, when you're there, like, subscribe, and ring the bell to get notifications when new webinars hit. Uh, we try to get the webinars up within five, six hours uh, after the presentation. So you can share those webinars with uh, staff members and colleagues. Remember though, that to get CE credit, you need to watch the webinar live. There's been some questions about, uh, do I get a full hours CE credit for one hour of webinar? Yes, you do. Um, uh, the, that if you watch canned uh, CE, uh, you may not depending on what state you're in or province. Um, next Thursday, the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry has Card P Day. Uh, you saw our three speakers there, Dr. Mark Douglas, Dr. Kim Parlett, and Dr. Ian Tester. Uh, thank you, Dr. Carbosh, for putting together the COVID-19 Getting Ready to Go Back presentation. And Dr. Yassin, you saw his flyer. He's continuing his implant study club with special guests uh, this past Wednesday. Uh, Dr. Katafucci was his uh, special guest. So you can catch that webinar also on YouTube. Um, we've got lots of, of great support and uh, thank you to the University of Washington School of Dentistry AGD student chapter uh, for our previous speaker. Uh, that was uh, Dr. Ann and he did a, just a beautiful job on interoral scanning. Uh, you'll want to see that webinar if you missed it and you can get that at YouTube. Uh, keep in mind all these webinars are being uh, produced because we've had uh, presenters, our speakers, our doctors have volunteered their time, their expertise, and we appreciate that. We could not do that. There's no honorariums being paid for any of these speakers. So again, a uh, big thank you from the Washington Academy of General Dentistry for doing these uh, presentations for us. CE credit. Your CE credit is coming from the University of Washington School of Dentistry. That CE credit will be emailed to you at the email address you registered at, and you should see that in your inbox within the next couple of days. 
please do not contact the Washington Academy of General Dentistry regarding your CE credit. If you have any questions, you want to contact the University of Washington, AG, uh, University of Washington Dental School CE Department if there's any errors or admissions on uh, your uh, CE credits. For AGD members, we will submit your CE credit directly to the Academy of General Dentistry, and those CE credits will show up in the next two to four weeks on your AGD transcript. Things are kind of backed up at the AGD, so uh, just have some patience with that. Um, we'd like to thank the Arkansas Academy of General Dentistry for putting together Arkansas AGD Day, and that's next Tuesday. Great line of speakers there again um, from Arkansas, and we'd like to thank Dr. Kenton Ross for putting those speakers to get together. For those of you that couldn't get on Terry Harris's uh, webinar here the other day, that is on YouTube. And he's going to be back next Wednesday afternoon for a couple of hours uh, when the flyer goes by. Again, if you have any questions for Terry, uh, copy down that email address. It's agd-covid at harrisbiomedical.net. And uh, Terry's putting together all those questions into kind of categories. And hopefully he will get to your question if you have uh, something that uh, you need uh, uh, Terry Harris's expertise. Um, next Friday, May 8th, uh, Dr. Yassine's Implant Study Club continues. For you young uh, dentists out there or dental students, remember Saturday, August 15th, we're continuing with our Crown Preparation 101 course. It's an analog to digital course, uh, walking students from seating the patient down to diagnosis, uh, doing the buildup, crown preparation, provisionalization, and releasing that patient with post-op instructions. Uh, for a lot of you, know, I know it's tough, you're going to miss out quite a few months of dental school here. Uh, so uh, for those of you that are graduating, uh, we will honor um, your student status to take that course in August uh, if, if you're a UW uh, School of Dentistry AGD member. Um, speaking of uh, programs, our 2020-2021 Master Track program has been put together. It's a great value. We have four sessions. Each session has uh, 28 hours of CE credit. And we've done a fee rollback. So instead of $5,500 for AGD members, we've reduced that down to uh, $4,000. Um, Dr. Michael Fling, who will be presenting here in just a few minutes, is one of our uh, lecturers for that series. And so um, some of what you're going to see today uh, will be part of that. But he's got a ton of material. And as you know, um, he's... Uh, a lecturer for Panky. He's done just a ton of stuff. So it looks like uh, we're over 400 participants so far, and we haven't even hit the uh, 2.30 mark. We'll just uh, wait here a few seconds, let a few more people get on, and so I can give instructions again. And for those of you that are new to the Zoom interface, take a look around, play with some of the buttons. You can exit full screen. You can bring up the chat feature. That chat feature, you can type little things in there. But if you have a question, questions can go in the Q&A feature. So play around with those uh, bars right now. See how that works. You can change the size of the speaker, the gallery, all that kind of stuff. You have control on your side. Do not uh, text us with saying, hey, it, it, the screen's too small. No, that's on your side. You control the size of the screen. You control the volume on your side. We've got uh, a good audio connection, and so uh, we shouldn't have any issues there. For those of you that are raising your hands, uh, we're not going to use the raise the hand feature here today unless uh, Dr. Fling had a specific question that he wants answered from you. Uh, Dr. Hayamoto, how are things sounding on your side there? Everything sounds great, Tim. 
Okay, terrific. All righty. Let me just check. Oh boy, we're just about at uh, 500 uh, participants here. So that's fantastic. All righty, it's 2.30. So welcome to the Washington Academy of General Dentistry Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE program brought to you by the Washington Academy of General Dentistry and the University of Washington School of Dentistry CE department. We'd like to thank some of our co-sponsors, the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prostodontics, Comet USA, Patterson Dental, and Snohomish County Dental Society, Pierce County Dental Society, and Seattle King County Dental Society. For those of you that are concerned about CE credits, your CE credits will be emailed to the email address you use to register for this event. Uh, you should see those emails coming within two to three days. Uh, that There will be a PDF. You can just put your name on there. It isn't specific to you, that PDF that's coming. Uh, it will record uh, how many uh, credit hours we have here today. So if Dr. Fling does an hour, you'll get an hour. If it's an hour and a half, it's a 1.5 and two hours. So we have two hours uh, a potential time, uh, but uh, the amount of time we are actually in this webinar will be reflected on your CE credit. If you miss this uh, webinar or somebody know, uh, missed it and wants to see it, you can go to YouTube, to Washington Academy of General Dentistry, to that channel. And remember to like, subscribe, and ring the bell so you are notified of upcoming webinars. Um, you see these flyers going by. You can use the QR codes to register for upcoming events or you can go to washingtonagd.org and be able to register on that website. Uh, just navigate around, look for the Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE logo, and you should be able to scroll down and register for any one of those events. Again, thank you, International Academy of Nathology, Arkansas Academy of General Dentistry, and the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prostodontics for putting together uh, the CE programs for next week. Um, want to now introduce uh, a good friend of mine, Dr. Michael Fling. He began his career in dentistry in 1976 as a laboratory technician. Graduating from Oklahoma University College of Dentistry in 1984, he now maintains a private practice with an emphasis on restorative dentistry. He has served as course director and clinical assistant professor in the Department of Fixed Prosthodontics and currently serves as director of advanced restorative dentistry at the OU College of Dentistry. He is the founder and president of Fling Seminars, providing advanced dental education to dentists dental teams, and te technicians throughout the world. He also serves as an associate faculty and course coordinator at the L.D. Pankey Institute. He has completed the process to be awarded the title of Pankey Scholar. As a member of the American Academy of Restorative Dentistry and the American College of Dentists, he has lectured internationally to dental and laboratory associations and to various study clubs on fundamental principles of restorative dentistry and achieving technical excellence. He has been named as one of the top 100 clinicians in dental education by dentistry today, every year since 2005. He has published numerous articles and is the author of 32 Laps, Tipping Points That Motivate Change and Identify Meaning in Your Business and in Your Life. Dr. Fling, welcome. I'm gonna stop sharing here and let you share your screen. Okay, thank you, Tim. All righty. Appreciate it, sir. Hey, good to see you again. Thank you for coming back. You know, your first seminar was so popular. Uh, I appreciate it. Well, um, you're, you're, you're welcome. I, I think the opportunity to spend an hour, hour and a half or so talking about how is it best to polish out new paint on the body of your race car, <laughs> and, and then we're going to talk about um, electrical connections and how is it best to put those together. And then I think the last phase will be to turbocharge and not to turbocharge. And then we'll kind of go from there. What do you think? That sounds good. Uh, when are you going to be done with that race car? It was in about the same amount of pieces when I was there last year. 
Him, that's not very polite, just so you know, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Bastard, sorry. <laughs> it, it is going to uh, be finished the first of never, so there you go. Yes. Uh, just a reminder, everybody, uh, the Fling Seminars uh, email is on uh, that first uh, page there. We'll put that up in the chat section. Uh, you can open the chat section up and uh, Dr. Hayamoto will be putting some links, et cetera, in and some uh, comments there regarding CE and et cetera. So with that, sir, I'm going to mute myself. All right, Tim. Thanks, buddy. So, you know, I, I got to tell you, this stuff he's put together is just amazing. I noticed you got Bill Robbins coming on Monday talking about uh, failures in his practice, but it, he only had an hour and a half. I know Bill well. He's going to need longer than that to, to talk about all of his failures. If you'll be sure and mention that to him when you, when you talk with him Monday, I, I would appreciate it. Actually, I got to tell you, Robbins is probably, what he's done for dentistry to me is just so mind-blowing. And uh, the use of global diagnosis and those things, just amazing. So just a great clinician. Don't tell him I said that part, though. Um, we got a lot going on. Um, I actually start back in my practice tomorrow. And uh, it's, it's, as you all know, it's incredibly interesting. Um, it, it, isn't it interesting that you, you really learn the true colors of a lot of people in these tough times? So uh, I'll leave it at that. But we start back tomorrow. We'll see how it goes, and uh, we'll go from there. Um, you see on your screen, that is my personal email, that MC Fling. Uh, feel free to touch base with me regarding anything. Put something in the remarks column so I'll know that it's not spam, so I'll actually open it. That is my uh, personal cell phone number below. Feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. So as Tim mentioned, um, I don't know, it was a week or so ago, I did another presentation. And um, in that presentation, we talked about some concepts of provisionalization uh, in the anterior segment. And this is one of them. Um, so you'll notice that as what I've done is, I've done a, a diagnostic wax up and from the wax up, I've made a stent. And this is out of Siltec Lab Putty. And then in that stent, we can use various materials to create a shell overlay. Um, if you happen to see your, um, oh, I actually forget. It was published just here a month or two ago, um, Dentistry Today or one of those things. Um, it, was just, it was just recently published. So there's kind of a step-by-step -step journal of that if you want to refer to that. But this is a shell overlay that I made with composite. And so you'll see that it's very thin. And um, in this scenario, it goes over, that goes down the facial. I will cure that with my composite. And then I'll take it down the lingual and cure that. And it meets in the middle. It just kind of, due to gravity, flows down in there. In this case, I was doing a veneer here and here, so we just covered the facial with those. And so the point is that we make some type of overlay, and we're going to look at different materials that we can use to do this with. And one of the biggest dilemmas with this is getting this out of the shell, uh, because these are very thin. And so I found it's really a two-person job to get these out. So I might be the one to stretch the stent apart while my assistant gets an instrument and helps tease it out or vice versa. But the point is, it's often a two-person job to get these things out. If you're getting it out and it fractures, the world is not coming to an end. Just push it back down into there, add a little more flowable composite where it's fractured, cure that, and it's mended. And then you keep playing with it until you can finally get it out. So this is the, the composite. This was actually done with flowable composite. And this is the composite shell that was made. So it's what I have done is after the shell has been trimmed, and we're going to talk about how to trim these in just a little bit, I then fill the inside of it with packable composite. And the packable composite has enough oompa to it that you can get it in place and, and position it and it'll kind of stay there. I clear a lot of the excess and I cure that. 
And then I go back with flowable composite to fill in the margins. And, and then those are polished and, and off it comes and, and you've got your provisional restoration. So that's just an overview of what we're going to discuss here for the next hour or so. Um, listen, I'm, I'm not telling you that this is the way you should do it. I'm just telling you it is a way to do it. There are definitely different ways to skin the cat. Um, so, you know, I got to tell you that, as you saw when we started, one of my hobbies is for years and years, I've raced cars. But I got to tell you, even before that, I, I raced go-karts. And the first time I got one of these darn go-karts that does, you know, 100 miles an hour kind of thing, I was horrible. I mean, I got to tell you, I got in the thing and, you know, I'm doing about 50 miles an hour thinking I'm just killing it. And, and I just wasn't. I just, matter of fact, I was pretty bad at it. But then as time went on, you get better and better at it as you practice more and more and you get to a point that you have some level of competence. My point is this, when you do this for the first time, if you choose to use this technique, first time you do it, it's probably gonna be a little frustrating because you just haven't done it before. Because what I'm begging you to do is just give it a little time, just play with it a little bit and you'll find that it will become easier and easier. Um, this is my wife, Leslie, and of course, this is me looking really good right there. Um, I was trained as a lab tech uh, back in the day. This is actually my lab technician now. Jeff and I were trained as lab technicians together back in high school. And uh, then I went on to dental school, and Jeff still has his, uh, his laboratory in Dallas and does my stuff. But my point is that with all this stuff, you know, you got to practice it over and over and over to really get better at it. Um, I, I think without question, um, having that lab background really does help. And some of the techniques we're going to discuss really came from my training as a lab tech. So keeping that in mind, um, once again, I, I, I mentioned this before, I, I don't have a dog in this hunt. I'm just giving you some techniques that have helped me. And I want you to really see this second from the last sentence right here. Some of my dentistry sucks, and it does. I think it's critical to understand that. I'm not gonna show you all the bad stuff. So uh, that's just how it is. I would tell you that DMG does supply some of my materials. Um, I'm not compensated by them, but they do supply a lot of the materials for some of my hands-on courses because I do offer a hands-on course where we actually fabricate some of these shell overlays. And Tim, I think we're actually gonna be doing that in, your, in the program uh, there in Washington as we go forward. So here it is, people. This is more important than any two. See, Tim, it does run. It's been painted now, you big turd. And uh, it goes off for interior here um, in about a month. Um, you know, this is what really makes it happen, though. I mean, it can look good and all that's great, but at the end of the day, it has to function well. And this, uh, you know, in the race car, obviously the function boils down to the engine and the transaxle and suspension and all that. So while it might look fast, it's all the stuff under the hood that really matters. And in regards to our teeth, it's the same deal. It can look great, but it's got to function well. And so the techniques I'm going to show you uh, really help me in terms of defining the function. Now, this was the first time I took the thing out to get gas in it. And notice right there, you see that? That's not the ice man, that's the policeman. I went literally less than a mile and man, he showed up. I'm like, oh goodness. Fortunately, he just wanted to come over and see the car. So, so that worked out pretty good for me. Um, so we've got to really understand um, the concept of functionally, it's got to work right if it's, gonna, if it's really gonna work well. Utilizing this technique, I've been able to really affect my everyday practice and dealing with the entire system and not just dealing with the tooth. And um, this is going to give us some advantage in terms of placement of these things to where we can really modify its position to help us with the functional aspect of it, not just the aesthetic aspect of it. So let me just give you the story of how all this happened for me. I do all of my own diagnostic wax-ups. Um, if, if you want a great waxer, this is it. It's a whip mix product. Um, I, I, I do my wax-ups because I enjoy it. To be honest with you, 
I just really don't think it's practical for most dentists to do their own diagnostic wax ups, but I, I choose to do that. And then with some of the lab work that I've done over the years, um, I have translated some of that into the clinic area. So as an example, back in the day when we used to stack feldspathic porcelain, if you're doing a case, say tooth number six through 11, you would have a metal coping and then you would put your feldspathic porcelain over the metal coping. You would put your Kleenex on it, draw the moisture out, condense it, dry it, shape it, take that off, put it in the oven and fire it. Well, to help with that shape, I learned many, many years ago that we would do a wax up and we would make an index. And that index would be put on the model, on the lingual portion of it, and we would actually stack our porcelain into that index to help us understand the shape and the inside of the lid position and length. So I said to myself, huh, why don't we do that with our composites? Why don't we do that to help us with what we do in our everyday practice? Now then, this lady presented to me and she wanted to have her front teeth a little bit longer prior to her granddaughter's wedding. Now, there's a lot cooking here. She's gonna see the periodontus for grafting and she's even an ortho case, but at this point, we were just trying to help her with, with her primary concern before the wedding. So I did my little wax up. I take a quick alginate, we pour that in a bite stone material. I make a Siltec stem. And this is exactly what I used to do back in the day when we would stack porcelain into it. The only difference is I'm gonna put this in the mouth. So now I have an index that describes exactly where I want my incisal edges. So is what I have done is I go in with a sharp 25 blade on my scalpel and notice I'm sectioning through the interproximal here. I will do it here, here, and I put mylar strips in here. Now I carefully position my index and you can see the mylar strips coming through. So now my inner proximals are separated. I've etched, I've primed, I've bonded, and you place the composite of your choice. I have my index to help me understand where that goes. Here you see me starting to fill that. And you do your thing and off it comes because you had your mylar strips in here my inner proximals were already opened and we do our shaping and you do your polishing and off you go. So that was one of the lab techniques that I took from the lab and just applied it to what I do clinically. So a lot of people would say, well, golly, Mike, that, that's a lot of trouble to go to. Well, it's really not. If you think about it, if this patient comes in with a broken front tooth or we're gonna lengthen and size ledges, for me to freehand these composites takes a lot of time. I can take a quick upper anterior alginate, pour it in bite stone, and uh, we allow that to set for eight minutes. So that can be separated in eight minutes. I can do my wax up. So literally in 15, 20 minutes, I can have this waxed and a stent made and ready to go. Or you can take your alginate, have the patient come back the next day and do it if you wanna work on this, you know, in a different time. So for me, it really is a time saver. I shared with you some of the other tricks in the anterior region that we use to kind of um, play with some of the, oh, the perceptions of what is really there. And in this case, this patient had a large bony defect right here. And again, we uh, provisionalized her after multiple, multiple surgeries and bone grafts, two implants were placed and uh, we ended up having fixtures put in place. We really worked hard to develop the interdental papilla here. And then here she is with her final crowns. The trick to making the crowns look great is to get a big old spit bubble right there where you don't want that dark hole to be seen. And, um, and then here she was a year later. And then here she was two years later. And she said, Dr. Fling, I'm, I'm not digging this. What can we do? And so I referred her to Dr. Hess and uh, I haven't seen her since. It worked out really good. So no, obviously my surgeon said, Mike, I, I can't do anything else. There's no blood supply. We've, we've done everything we can do. 
These were screw retained implant retained crowns. So I mentioned this because I will use this technique with implants also, the shell technique, where I can use a host of different abutments, whether it's a temporary abutment, whether it is, um, um, oh, it depends on which brand you're using. We use a lot of uh, um, 3i stuff, or I'll use, uh, or rather ITI stuff. So the Vario base, um, and we will use the same technique over those abutments so that we can provisionalize. In this scenario is what we ended up doing. This was pink composite that we added. Um, and here you see the mylar that was put in place. And then she can come in here with floss and still clean under that. But my point is that uh, while we looked at this last time, if you don't have this kit with this pink stuff, there's the phone number. Um, They've got all kinds of pink stuff, it, from light pink to deep purple to flowable to packable. You can mix this stuff and really kind of play with it and really match things really well. But my point is that I will use the shell technique even over implants as we do some of this stuff. So keeping that in mind, I mentioned Dr. Robbins and how global, uh, global diagnosis has helped me so much. I have taken Dr. Robbins' concept of global diagnosis and created what I call the global restorative footprint and the global restorative sequence. And as what that is, it's a, it's a sequence of seven steps where in the lab, you use those seven steps to develop a treatment plan, whether it's on the models or using the chart or whatever. But you, we, we've got to develop a treatment plan for that patient. Then we have to go into the mouth and we have to apply that. And that's the clinical restorative sequence. So keeping that in mind, these are the seven steps of the diagnostic footprint. So um, not that it's that important that we understand that, other than I want you to know that I spend a lot of time, this is where I'm in the lab, trying to figure this out diagnostically. And for me, a lot of times that's with diagnostic study models and doing a diagnostic wax up. Could this be done digitally? And the answer is absolutely. Uh, you could get a scan, you could create your digital wax up, then you could print that model, then you can make a stent on the printed model, and then do your shell. So <clears throat> when I do a waxing course, um, and I believe Tim, we're doing that also in Washington, if I remember correctly. Um, uh, yes, we are. Yeah. So when we're talking about waxing the anterior teeth, I always start by measuring the width of the central incisor. And I know there's about a four to three ratio that the length of this should be about 25% longer. So if I've got a width here that's seven and a half millimeters, I know the length should be about 10. So then the big question becomes, am I bringing the incisal edge down? Am I raising the gum line up or a combination of both? But the point is, I use the width to establish the length. So I do my wax and I get the anterior completed. And then after we go through our process of getting the anteriors all completed, I do the lower posterior. And then after we do the lower posterior, I mate the upper posterior to meet that. So that's the laboratory sequence that we go through. So is what I found is that in the lab, this is pretty easy because I have some ways to cheat. Because I have learned that if I ask a dentist to do a diagnostic wax up, this is the response I get. I get a very insincere smile and they say, fling, we're, we're just not gonna do it. So the waxing course that we're doing, I think is invaluable. Um, without question, it could be done digitally, but boy, I tell you, I just love good old wax for sure. So keeping that in mind, I teach doctors to wax like you would draw it. So one of the first things I do in my waxing course is we practice how to draw the teeth. Because it's interesting, if you can get to a point that you can successfully draw these teeth really well, it's amazing how you can translate that into wax with just a little bit of training. So for my patients, I typically have two sets of models that we will have in our consultation. One set is mounted and it is left alone. And then the second set is the set with the diagnostic wax up that is completed. 
So now they can see the before and they can see the after. So it's with the after that I will use to make our stents to make our overlays. Well, this is one of the things I use to cheat. And if you don't have this thing, go get one. It's called a Nay Rapid Waxer. You can get it from your, uh, you can get it from Patterson or from Shine, or you can get them online. I think they're like 90 bucks. They're not much. And it's what they do is they have got two sets of upper and two sets of lower posterior teeth in this silicone thing. So here's what you do. That electric waxer that I showed you earlier is what you're going to do is you're going to get that electric waxer, you're gonna turn it up to its maximum temperature. We're gonna get white presentation wax in stick form. Hold it against the shank of that electric waxer and that wax will pour into this form almost as quickly as you can. The point is that you can fill these tooth shapes with wax very, very quickly. Once the wax is in there, I then take it over to the sink. I run it under cool water. It chills it. And then you pop them out and you have teeth. So in my waxing, one of the things that I teach is if you're going to wax, get the plaster out of the way. So this is the case that started the whole concept of shell overlay for me. Let me share with you what happened with him. He presented to me, and you can see that he's got really heavy posterior wear, large tori, he's got heavy dental alveolar extrusion, he has a bridge that goes six to 11, and the abutment teeth are in, endodontically treated, and there's very little to no feral effect. So here you see I've completed my diagnostic wax up. Now notice the shapes of these back teeth are exactly from that form that I showed you just a second ago. I have cut the plaster down all the way to here. I've gotten it completely out of the way. And then that gives me the room to set my tooth on there and so there's very little to do to create this back tooth shape. I've just got to manage to find a way to put it in place, wax the axial contour, and boom, you can wax back teeth very quickly. So is what happened in this case was I diagnosed and treatment planned him as an orthodontic case where we were going to do orthodontic intrusion we were going to also consider changing vertical dimension for facial aesthetic reasons. And then it was gonna be full mouth crown and bridge with four fixtures, one, two, three, four. And you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, the treatment plan was only gonna run about 75,000 bucks or so and we were done. So as I presented my treatment plan, he seemed all on board and I didn't hear from him for several months. And I get a phone call. And the phone call, he, he called my receptionist, Tammy, and said, Tammy, I'd like to have my record sent to so-and-so. And I thought, oh, crap, because I know that this place where he's going to go to, they, they just, mm, it wasn't my first choice for him to go somewhere else. So I called him. I said, Steve, what's up? He said, Dr. Fling, I'd love for you to treat my mouth. He said, but I just can't afford it. I said, well, if I could find a way to phase this treatment, would you be willing to sit down and let's talk about ways to do this? He said, yeah, I would. So I really had to scratch my head and say, how can I phase this? How can I open his vertical dimension? How can I affect the aesthetics here? How can I deal with dental, dental alveolar extrusion and do this in a way that we're not doing everything at once? Well, I said, you know what? I was successful with what I did in my diagnostic wax up on the models. I knew the shapes that I had done because I did it. And I said, why can't I just apply that to the mouth? So I shared with you that I keep a library of wax teeth. And that's what this is. I've just poured that wax in the mold. They've hardened. I keep them tooth by tooth here. 
This is the waxer. Remember what I said, when you do your waxing, always over reduce the plaster. Get it out of the way because you'll be waxing and it trims really well, but you get to the plaster and it's no bueno. When I'm positioning the wax piece on the model, I use a little bit of white rope wax to, to help hold it in place. For me, I use this waxer um, and I, I work at about 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, I can get, if you touch base with me, I make zero amount of money or touch base with Tim, but Whitmix actually offers a two pin waxer for about 220 bucks. So they're next to nothing. And they're really good waxers. I support them because I like them. I, that's what I use. And they also furnish some of those for our hands on courses. So uh, it's a great waxer to have. So in this scenario, if this patient has got a broken tooth, I've already had my teeth made as we described earlier. Here you see a little dot of white rope wax I put in place to stabilize it. Remember what I said, I would rather over reduce the plaster. I simply position the tooth, I go back, I will add wax in here to fill in the discrepancy in the axial portion. You shape it and literally just a couple of minutes you've waxed an entire tooth. This happens to be that case that I showed you of the gentleman where we're having to figure out how are we gonna fix him. So notice I've waxed the anterior, the back, I've cut these down to where they're just almost not there. Here you see the white rope wax, and this was his final wax up. So I said, all right, I can do this. Let's do it in the mouth. Now I want you to think about that because I've mentioned a couple of things here. First of all, diagnostically, I've got to come up with something in the lab but now in the clinic, I got to do something on the tooth. This is the clinical restorative sequence. And here's the dilemma that I run into in the mouth a lot. I might get the anterior where I want them. Or maybe when I'm making my provisionals, getting the incisal edge where I want it to be here, maybe I get my stent positioned where it's too far facial or too far lingual or I push it down too far or not far enough, and I go, dang it, I'm off. Or maybe when I'm doing the posterior, maybe I get the lower plane of occlusion just right with my provisionals, but when I'm doing the upper, I push that stint down too far, and now we're not in occlusion. So it can become very frustrating. So I wanted to come up with ways that I could minimize the errors. Here's another thing you can use to cheat. In the anterior part of the mouth, when you're doing your wax up, there are silicone guides for the front teeth also. This company called Smileline USA, here's their phone number. They have anterior silicone molds. You do the same thing. Get your wax in there. You've got anterior teeth. Okay, now then. I shared with you these waxing tips and that I did that with him and that we're gonna set these in we're gonna follow the contours and we're gonna add these and off we go. So now I wanted to ask the question, if that's the case, how can I do this in the mouth? So here he is. I knew that I had opened him vertically and I knew what I had done with a level plane of occlusion. So I said, I gotta think out of the box to make this affordable for him. Here was my wax up. So is what I did is in that same silicone mold that I did my wax up from, I went in and I did flowable composite. And you can see the thin composite shells that I've made here. You can almost see through them, right? So they're very thin. Now this was my first time to do it. So I was just experimenting here, right? Here's what I did. Here you see me working on this premolar right here. I beveled, I etched, I primed, I bonded. I first started with mylar strips. This is my composite shell right here. I put packable composite inside of the composite shell and I seeded it. And because that packable composite is firm enough, I could move that tooth to get it just where I wanted it. 
and I was eyeballing it based upon my diagnostic wax up. I cleaned the excess from the margin, I cured it, I went back with flowable composite to fill in any marginal discrepancies and I polished it and I did one premolar tooth. Now, is what I finally figured out to do is if I'm doing this tooth, I got to a point where it's what I learned to do is I got my, my, uh, a, my Toffelmeyer matrix band, the metal ones, right? I would put one around the canine. I would put one around the second premolar. Now that would keep my interproximals from sticking together and I would bond my overlay onto that tooth. Then when I wanted to move back to this tooth, I would move my matrix, my Toffelmeyer matrix band around this tooth and around my first molar, and then I would bond onto that tooth. So here you see, I did this tooth, and then I did this tooth. Then I did this tooth, and then I did this one. And then here and here, and I carried on back. And I simply leveled my plane of occlusion just like I did in my diagnostic wax up. I went in with a small round burr and I created holes in the gold crown and I ran flowable in there. I would, I filled it into the top a little, I cured that and then I bonded my composite overlay onto that composite. And I just continued to do that until I got the lower plane of occlusion the way I wanted it. And I was trying to make that look like as much as I could my diagnostic wax up. Then I did the upper and I simply mated it to that just like I'd done in my wax up. So here you see the lower plane of occlusion with my composite overlays. Here you see the upper plane of occlusion with my composite overlays. I did some light equilibration, but again, I knew from my diagnostic wax up that all this mated pretty well. Now, I had to deal with all of this. The orthodontist went ahead and started his intrusion. We're going to stop when we get free gingival margins level. And we got these off and did a provisional bridge. And he was keenly aware that we were going to have to put implants in this anterior segment. And his first question is when, and my answer is I have no idea. I don't know if those, these are going to last a month, a year. I, I just don't know because the prognosis of those abutment teeth was so poor. Now, after the ortho was completed, we had intrusion. We got free gingival margins improved. I was really puzzled about spacing here. Um, you'll notice he's got three incisors. That's a canine. That's a canine. So. I elected to stay with that. I did an impression of the lower uh, overlays after the orthodontic intrusion was completed. And I did my wax up. I made my Siltec stent. I went in with flowable composite. And this is a shell of composite. It is not solid. Hear that really well. It's a thin shell that goes down the facial, over the incisal, up the lingual a little, but it's hollow in the middle. Okay? Then we're going to trim the length of this composite back to where I can passively get this to seat. Here. So notice I've removed the length of it to where I can passively get this to the position that I want it. Then I have beveled, I've etched, I've primed, I've bonded. Here you see I've placed packable composite. Again, the packable composite is firm enough that I can get this positioned in place where I want it to be. It's seated, the excess is trimmed, it's cured, flowable composite is added into the margins here, it's polished, and there are his uh, composite overlays on the anterior segment. Now, I would tell you that I did this case, I don't know, it's been three and a half years ago or so, something like that. It's been a while. Um, here is his upper provisional. 
Um, we have, knock on wood, we have not had one failure of any of these composites at this point. Uh, the beauty of, of this is what it's done for me, it's now allowed me to treat him on a tooth by tooth basis. So if we do have a failure, um, we've got to put a permanent crown here for whatever reason. Now I can treat him a tooth at a time. I'm not committed to restoring an entire arch. Now he has had since this time, we did put a fixture on the two canines and in the two centrals and he is sporting two three unit implant retained bridges now. So um, that's the process. So here he is before, here he is provisionalized. And uh, here was his smile after he was provisionalized and look how much better he feels about himself. Isn't that great? So <clears throat> Tim, that's really not him, just so you know. That, that was me about 10 years ago, just, yeah. Okay. So let's go over some rules, and then we're gonna look at the application of this with some different cases. That was my, that was what got it going for me. And, and I was just trying to find a way to get him treated where we could do something on a smaller basis where he could afford to do it. That's all it boiled down to. So with our technique, the first thing we've gotta do is we've gotta get a form of some kind um, whether it's with a diagnostic wax up and a Siltec stent, whether it's from a printed model that you've done digitally, somehow you've got to get the form of what do you want it to be, okay? After you've done that, now we've got to create a shell. And that shell, we can make it out of a host of different materials. Since I've started this process, I would tell you I make them out of flowable composite. I make them out of bisacryl. I make them out of Luxacrown. I've, I've used it all and they all work really well. So I, I guess maybe the material to use is whatever you have the most of. How about that? I don't know. So uh, the point is I've done it with multiple color, with multiple materials. In regards to color, I choose to make the shell out of a lighter, more translucent material. And the reason is that these shells should be made pretty thin. You can change the color of them when you put the packable composite on the inside of them. So if I've got a real translucent um, shell that I've made out of, um, I use aesthetic, so maybe it's out of a, a C1, um, you know, that's a really translucent, almost gray something. I could go back with a A1 packable and really change the color of that. So you can play with that to work to get the color however you want it to be. The removal, I mentioned for me, it's typically a two person job. Somebody stretching the skin apart. Um, somebody else is, is wiggling the thing out. Just remember, if you're getting it out and it breaks, just put it back in there, add a little more flowable, and then uh, cure it, and then, then off you go. Now, <clears throat> I obviously am from Oklahoma because I can't keep up with numbers properly. So we would actually make this one number five. I think that's how it would work. Isn't that how it goes in Washington, Tim? Yeah. Trim it for a passive fit. And this is critical. You've got to trim the extent of the overlay to where it will passively go into place. And this is hands down one of the biggest errors I see, where you get your overlay shell and you try to get it in place and go. So what do you do? You get your big fat thumb and you push. And what happens? It breaks. So don't do that, okay? Couple of things. If you've made your overlay and it's been less than 24 hours, you can typically add packable composite, more bisacryl, or more luxacrown to the inside of that, and you don't have to add adhesive to the underside of the overlay. If you've gone more than 24 hours, it is recommended on the inside of that overlay to add and cure some adhesive and then place your packable or whatever material you're putting in there. 
okay? That comes straight from the people at DMG. Now, I would tell you that if I've been a while, if, if I have contaminated it a lot, if it's, you know, I'm working on a big case and it's been maybe four or five hours and I'm going to add a lot, I, I just, I err by adding more adhesive. Um, but that, that's the rules in regards to adhesive. I use packable composite because it's firm enough that it allows me to position it where I want it to be. Now, let's think about this just a second. I'm going to show you a case here in a little bit where I actually make a composite cores um, using the same technique. Well, what if you got a composite core and it's seven millimeters thick? If I fill that entire thing with packable composite and seat it on the mouth and go to cure it, it's, you know, I'm not going to cure that deep. So you've got to use some discretion. And in that case, I might add some packable on the on the occlusal portion on the inside of that overlay, cure that, and then add more so that I can position it. So when I cure it, I'm not having to cure through seven millimeters of composite. So you've kind of got to use your, your, uh, your noodle to look that one through. And then after I've got it trimmed, it's cured, I then go back with flowable composite that I work into the margins. And, um, and then I cure that and then polish that up as you've seen. So let's take a look at just a few cases. This uh, is a, one of my favorite patients. She's got a lot cooking. She has got dental alveolar extrusion. She has vertical maxillary excess. She has a hypermobile lip. And she said, Dr. Fling, you can fix two of them, but not three. We're not doing that surgery thing. I said, okay, I got it. So it's what we did is we had overcorrection done through orthodontic intrusion. And we did that because I wanted to give her a better proportion length to width ratio of the tooth. So as she went through this process, she got to a point here where she said, Dr. Fling, I look like an idiot. Can you do anything to help me? And I said, yeah, we can. So she ran over to the orthodontist. He removed the, the, uh, the elastics and, and the wire. And then she came to my office. We took an alginate. I poured it. And she went home that evening. And while she was gone that evening, I waxed this to how I wanted it to be. And I made a shell that evening with my composite. So she came back the next day. Here you see the composite shell. You know, I'm, I'm a little disappointed with my images here because this is misleading. These are not solid. They are, they are empty in the middle. So it is a shell that where I started to go down the facial and cure it, I then go up the lingual and cure it, but in the center, in the middle under this, it is a hollow shell. I then placed my packable composite. I seed it to place to where I want it to go. I cured it. I went back with flowable composite to correct any of the marginal discrepancies. And here she was with her uh, shell overlays. Now, here's the beauty for me with this. I would tell you that this is one of these cases, you know how sometimes it goes really good and sometimes it doesn't go so good, right? This appointment for me to get these front teeth bonded in place took one hour. And, um, you know, it, it just doesn't always go that quick. It just, this one happened to go that quickly. But remember, I've got to trim these to where they're passive, the packable composite in place. She had very easy embrasures to get to, to separate and to, to clean all that. And, and there we are. Now, the downside to this was when we got finished here, he got all the brackets off and she said, well, Dr. Fling, you said I was going to need veneers. Do I still need those? And I said, uh, not really, on it. And so uh, she's still wearing those. And we did these, goodness gracious, it's been probably three, four years ago. And she's still sporting those. So um, it's worked out really well. It's just a great conservative way to do these cases. Now, just to show you how easy this can go, this is the first time that one of my residents tried this technique. So I teach this technique with my residents. It was a lower anterior case. These work great on lower anteriors, because think about it. 
With lower anteriors, these are in a compressive load. As a jaw protrudes, it goes forward, the incisal edge of these lower anterior teeth meet against the lingual of the upper, and this is compressive loading. So, you know, these materials hold up really well under compression. So, <clears throat> Michael is his name, uh, was, was the, one of my residents that did this. He did his wax up, he made a Siltec stent, and here you see the shell that he started to make. And again, he did this with composite. Now, here's the thing, when you get your shell out, one of my sayings that I have with my residents is you have to use your eyes. And here's what I mean by that, is when I'm looking on the inside of this shell, if when I'm gently seating this to get it passively to fit, if this shell, if this is interfering with that going all the way down, I'm gonna go in with the high speed with the diamond burr and I will trim this and open this up until I have nothing hanging up to prevent that from going down all the way. So you've got to, this is really, really critical, people. You've got to really use your eyes and inspect to make sure that you can passively get it to place. So this is Michael starting to get it to place. And you'll notice he's over too far to the right. And I don't know, he may be a little long, but you know, this is him starting to work with it. Now, in this case, we are gonna have these individual, they weren't splinted. And so I have learned as I've done more and more of this is when you're going to have these individual, get the entire piece trimmed and adjusted to where it passively goes to where you want it to go. Then on your napkin behind the patient's head, we draw circles with tooth numbers. And as what we will do is we will get a really thin diamond disc and we go in from the lingual about maybe four fifths of the way through here. And I get my little fingers here and I go snap and I break that terminal tooth off right here. And we set it into the little circle that says tooth number 27. And then I come over to here and we do it the same thing here. And I put it in 26, 25, 24, 23, 22. Why do I do that? Because I'm telling you, when you try to put the wrong tooth on the wrong tooth, it doesn't work out well. So it's just a way to keep up. So Michael did that. Here he is um, starting to get it in place, clearing the excess packable composite, going back with flowable, and this was his first attempt at doing that. You know, it's not perfect, I get it, but you know, for him to build these up by hand and do these six teeth, I'm just telling you, it would have taken him probably four or five hours. This was an hour and a half appointment, and he got that in place. So um, that was a technique that he used. Now, I progressed with this concept as we looked at my clinical restorative sequence. Because look at what we've got. I get the front where I want it to go. Now I'm going to level my lower plane of occlusion front to back and side to side. So here you see I've got the anterior provisionals where I want them to be. Now I've got to get the lower posterior. So you'll see I've leveled our plane of occlusion here to here. Well, what if I get my stent seated and I push it too far? Well, now my plane of occlusion isn't level. Or what if I don't seed it enough and now it's up too high? Or what if I get it too facial or too lingual? If I have a shell and I put packable composite inside of it, or in this case, as provisional restorations, I made these out of bisacryl. So I made a bisacryl shell. I trimmed it to where it would passively seat. I then put more bisacryl inside of it and I will seat this to where visually it's where I want it to be. So now I've leveled my plane of occlusion front to back and side to side. But here is where the rubber meets the road, coordinating the upper posterior to the lower posterior. Because here's what I would find. I'd get all my lower posteriors just right, I would seat the uppers and it never failed. My occlusion just wasn't happening the way I wanted it to be. So the question is, can I use this to help me so that I can get these provisionals in a place to where my clusal plane is like I want it to be 
and to where I'm also in function the way I want it to be. So let's go through this real quick and let me show you how we've done this. This is a lady that um, is going to be a full mouth reconstruction case. She has, is going to go through ortho because she has a lot of dental alveolar extrusion. And you can see her free general margins are way down here. You hardly see any of your lower anterior tooth. Obviously, there's a lot of tooth wear, and we're going to do our thing. So here she is, post-ortho. Um, they got free general margins up quite a bit. The lower, to be honest with you, we just couldn't get those intruded the way we wanted to. They, they, they were some, but we, we wished we had gotten more, but, but we didn't. So at this point, I go ahead, I take my uh, impressions, and I complete my diagnostic wax up. The orthodontist, Dr. Birdwell, had given me plenty of space here so that I could have the room to do what I needed to do to get my coupling. And I get the anterior waxed first. Now, here's what you can do. I get this upper anterior waxed. Now I can make a stent. My stent will have back teeth for stability. So when I make my provisional here, my stent goes to place and I know this is in the correct place. Then I do the lower anterior and I do the same thing. I make a lower stent. So now when I seat these stents, I have back teeth for stability. So that's good. If you wait and make your stents after all of the wax up is completed, you have nothing stable in the back back here because we've opened the vertical and these teeth are taller. So I would have no way to stabilize this stent. And that means when I make my provisionals here, I can be off. I can get too far facial lingual, seated too far, seated not enough. So in this case, I made my anterior stents with just my anterior teeth waxed up. Now, this reinforces what I shared with you earlier. You can see where her teeth are located, but I've just gone and I cut those teeth down. I just get them out of the way. I know that's where the tooth is. I use my white rope wax and you will find that you can wax a lower posterior section in a matter of minutes because you have your preformed teeth that you set in here. You get your occlusal plane, your curve of speed, curve of Wilson just right. You add a little wax on your axial contour and you've got the back wax. Now we've got to coordinate the upper back to fit against it. And I do the same thing. I cut away all of the back teeth. I put my rope wax on. And because that rope wax is kind of soft, I can literally move these teeth and get them in the position that I want them because I have some give with that rope wax. I wax my axial contours and I pretty darn quickly get the upper posterior teeth waxed. So I thought, huh. Why don't I do that in the mouth? That would make a whole lot more sense. So I've made my posterior stents after all of my wax up is completed. I prep the anterior. I make my upper anterior provisionals. Remember this stent had back teeth that gave me stability. I prepped the lower anteriors. I did no incisal reduction. We did orthodontic intrusion. That was my incisal reduction. I just did some axial reduction. My stent had back teeth for stability. I made my lower anterior provisionals. I adjust the occlusion to where I want it to be. I'm coupled. Now I go to the lower back. When I make provisionals, let's take a look at how I trim these. I use a high speed hand piece. And with high volume suction, my assistant is blowing air and she's catching all of that dust. Now, for this was pre COVID 19, right? Um, I would tell you that one of the things I have seen is you go to Home Depot and you buy a funnel and you get the old funnel and you put it in your high speed, uh, your high volume suction, and uh, there's a YouTube on it and it looks really effective seems to be a great way to, to maybe catch more of this stuff. But because I've got um, a heavy chamfer or, or a, uh, even a shoulder, I can pretty clearly see my margins. I'll go and get rid of that, that excess. 
and I'll get those trimmed. Um, and then I'll reline as needed to get my margins the way I want them. So now I've got the anterior complete. The lower posterior is what I have done here is I've made a bisacryl shell. I trimmed it to where it passively seats. I then add more bisacryl to the underside of it. I seat it in the mouth until visually I get this where I want it to be. So now I've done that. My margins are trimmed. Now it's time to do the upper posterior. And this is, this is the game changer right here for you. So I've got the anteriors provisionalized. I have the lower posteriors roughly provisionalized. I know that I've got my plane of occlusion where I want it to go. Now I've got to get my upper posterior to mate to this properly. I know in my wax up, this is what I had, so it should coordinate pretty well. I have made a bisacryl shell. I take it out of my stent and I trim it until it passively seats. This is a test question. Would I rather trim the margin to where it's short and open and exposed or would I rather have this margin too far? And the answer is I would always rather over trim my margin because if we don't over trim it, it can't passively seat. Now that I've over trimmed this, I'm going to fill this with more bisacryl and we're going to seat it into the mouth. So let's take a look. There you see I've put some around the margins. And now when I seat this, I'm going to underseat it. I don't want to push it down all the way. Oh, man, now bite together. Have the patient close and they will help you get it positioned to the correct place. If I did seed it too far, I would take it out after it's hard and I would add a little more and I would just do it again. I wouldn't take out what I already have. Back to you. Slip that hard in a couple of minutes. This has dramatically reduced my occlusal adjustment on these cases. Here you see it coming out. Now I go back with my diamond and my high-speed handpiece. I trim up the margins. I go with my disc. I create my, inside, my uh, interproximal embrasures. And, uh, and here she is provisionalized. So the beauty of this technique is underseat that shell, have the patient close, and because you've worked hard on your diagnostic wax up to know you're about where you need to be, my occlusal adjustment on these cases has been minimized to very little. So it's just really saved me a lot of time and effort. So uh, there you go. So that was that technique. By the way, you see this right here, people? This is when I started drawing the circles on paper behind the patient's head and labeling the teeth. Because if you try to seat this central incisor onto that one, and that one onto that one, it doesn't work very good. Actually, it'll work just well enough that you can't get it off, and then you, you destroy the crown to get it off. Um, I heard that happen to somebody here in Oklahoma. I don't know who, but there you go. Uh, just another example, this is the Luxa crown material. That is the same material that I used on the case previous. If I've got a patient where we're gonna be doing this and um, they're gonna be in provisionals for an extended period of time, so in this case, we're opening vertical dimension. 
then I, I do this with Lexacrown. Um, once again, I'm making a thin shell. I'm passively seeding it, and then I will fill the inside of it with more bisacryl. This is a case where she just had root decay and stuff going on everywhere. And uh, so we're working hard on, on getting her provisionalized and endo and all kinds of fun things. And, and here you see me making the, the shell on the posterior back here. And, and then here she is provisionalized. So same technique um, that we just uh, described. So I want to take just a few minutes and then I'll open it up to questions to show you a few other uses of these shell overlays. Because it's really, really, really been neat with what I call transitional restorations. Um, so I mentioned the use of Luxacrown in some of these circumstances. This is a patient that presented to me, um, she just could not afford to do much. So um, she homeschools their daughter, who's got some uh, uh, definite challenges with their daughter. So her husband, um, he works in the oil field and he's gone a lot. They don't have dental insurance. And you know, if she were at our dental school, the treatment for this tooth would be endodontic treatment, probably a posting core and a full coverage crown. If you think about it though, if we're going to cover this tooth with a full coverage crown, by the time I do my facial reduction out here, there's gonna be very little to no structure left. So I've got very poor feral effect. So we're gonna to have to go to probably a posting core. And so we're gonna do all of that and still have a guarded prognosis. So I said, you know what? Is there a way we can think out of the box with this? So I just took what we've already described here you see me using flowable composite and I'm making a composite shell. I cure it, we pop that bad boy out and we trim this until it passively seats. That's a test question people, that passive fit thing, right? It is passively fitting in place here. We've removed all of the decay. I actually put a pin in here to help with mechanical retention. We etch, we prime, we bond, we filled it with packable composite. We then went back with flowable composite around the margins, and there's our tooth. Now, you could call that a lot of things. For her, that's going to be a permanent restoration for some time. And I contend that that might even be better than a full coverage restoration. Um, it could serve as a composite core, where if I wanted to go back and prep that, I could. But uh, this is held in there really well for her. She didn't have to have endo. We don't have a post in the tooth. And life's been pretty good. So, so that's that. This is a lady that presented to me that had a lot going on. She is going to have ortho. But prior to ortho and prior to perio, we have to get her stabilized. So you see a lot going on. Here's a molar that it's not good. This tooth is broken and this old amalgam core, the lingual here is gone. Uh, this is, yeah, it's just, you know, it's not good. So we got to figure out how are we going to stabilize her? And so in the past, it's what I would have done in a circumstance like this, or maybe even here, I would have prepped the tooth, built up a composite core and then placed a provisional restoration on there. And then, we would have gotten her off to the orthodontist and he would do his thing and never fails. You know, after about a year in ortho, the temporary is coming off because it's been torqued and all those fun things, or you get it off later and there's recurrent decay and you know, the thing. And, and so I said, well, let's just take the same concept and let's apply it to these cases. I've completed my diagnostic wax up. I have made my Siltec stent. I have made a composite shell. I have trimmed it to where they passively seat. I etch, I prime, I bond, and I've used this same concept back here on this molar. This is a tooth that typically would get a composite core and a temporary crown. So I just asked myself, why do that? I mean, a composite core in my practice, you're gonna spend 500 bucks, and then a temporary crown, you're gonna spend another 500 bucks. 
well, what if we just did a composite core, saved this patient tons of money. I removed the decay. I made a shell from my Nay Rapid Waxer. I trim it to where it passively seats. I place my packable composite inside of it like you see here. I position it, get rid of the excess, marginal discrepancy with flowable, trim it up. There is that same tooth. That is her composite core. Now, as she goes through ortho, there's no reason to put her in a temporary crown here. We've eliminated the decay. We have something that's very stable. You can see I've done another one right here. It goes through the distal. It comes along here and it comes to here and incorporates all the lingual. Here you see I've done one just on this lingual cusp here. And here she is prior to going to ortho. So this was a composite shell overlay here on half of the central, all of the lateral, the back molars as we just looked at. She's gonna have perio here, she's gonna have ortho, off she goes. So it's just really been a great benefit to our patients in terms of cost, in terms of everything. Um, now, I would tell you, we don't have time today, but um, it's what I've started doing is let's pretend that this is gonna be a, a final restoration. What if you've got your diagnostic wax up and you customize your composite shell where you lay it up, you cure it, you take it out, you cut it back, you inlay different colors, then you put your packable and seed it and cure it and you've customized basically a laminate veneer and composite that's gonna serve as their final restoration. So there's a lot of ways we can play with this to think out of the box. So um, that's just some of the techniques that we've used. I'm gonna go past this just a second because we're gonna be a little short of time. I wanna show you one last case here. Dr. Fling, you take all the time you need. We've, we've budgeted till 4.30 if need be. Okay. So we've got another 45 minutes or so? We do. We've got lots of questions too, though. So yeah. Okay. okay. So <clears throat> this is a just a perfect example of where this technique really, really, really makes a difference. So for me to freehand this in composite, it's just a tough deal. I mean, it takes a long, long, long time. This patient presented, he actually was horsing around at school with a buddy. His buddy threw a trash can at him and caught him in the mouth. And uh, he presented to me like this. So the first thing we're gonna do is take an alginate. We're gonna pour that in bite stone, eight to 10 minutes, it's hardened. We're gonna wax that up. We're gonna make a Siltex stent. We're going to make a shell. So here you see, I've done just that. My wax up is completed. Here's my Siltex stent material, my flowable composite and my shell. And we should all know by now, how do we trim it until it passively seats. Now, when you do this, don't do a straight bevel here, okay? get very irregular and with different depths on your bevel. Because it's what it'll do is it'll break up the light. If you get it just completely uniform and straight across, you're gonna see a line. So go back and kinda just very subtly break this up in terms of depths and in terms of positioning of that bevel. We're going to passively seed it. I do not want my margins overextended or it won't go to place to where I want it to be. We place our packable composite, we get rid of the excess, the flowable on the margins, we polish it up. I actually did this case on him, goodness gracious, it was many moons ago. He actually is married now and has a child and he is still sporting that composite. So um, that's the technique for the shell overlay. Now, here's the deal guys. Tim knows it's one of my sayings. You know now, this might be an, an, an example of a new technique that maybe you haven't seen before, but it's not difficult. And, and, and it's not in the knowing of how, it's, it's just not that hard. It's in the application of what you already know. That becomes the thing. And that, 
that actually is a, is a real cultural shift. So keeping that in mind, um, Tim, how about if we go ahead and open it up to questions? Uh, sounds good. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I think one of the things you said early on is so important about uh, uh, comparing it to driving the go-kart and, and being a little frustrated at first. It, it's going to take a little time and a little experience, uh, but once you get it dialed in, boy, it's, it's a, a world of difference. Um, can you briefly talk about the, the DMG, the, uh, the, it's, uh, what is the name of the material that you're using? There? DMG has a material called Luxicrown, and is what it is, it's actually a composite, it's actually a bisacryl, uh, composite material. And in Europe, it is actually used as a permanent restorative material. In the United States, and I would assume Canada would be the same, that it, it doesn't, it cannot be used, it's not to be used as a permanent restorative material. I refer to it as an intermediate material. You know how uh, conventional bisacryls can be a little brittle and they can yeah. tend to fracture some? This, that's one of the reasons this bisacryl work or this uh, lexicron works better. It just doesn't do that. It, it holds its color well. Um, it trims very similar to conventional bisacryl. Um, it, it handles a little differently. It takes a little bit longer to cure than conventional bisacryl, but it is a, a, a self-curing material just like conventional bisacryls. So if I've got a case where I'm going to have an intermediate material like that lady where she was going to go into ortho and I did the front and back teeth, I knew that those were going to have to last us for a few years because her ortho treatment plan was about two and a half years. So I used Luxacrown on her. If I'm doing a large case where I'm opening vertical, I typically will have my patients in provisionals for at least three months and sometimes six months, seven months. You know, it just kind of depends. So I tend to use Luxacrown for those cases also. All righty. Uh, do you use any sort of stent to place the shell on the tooth? Just trying to understand how not to make the tooth too long or short or how to prevent the arch to be canted. So the answer is it depends. On that large case, here, let me go back to it. On this case here, remember that I had done a wax up of the upper and lower anteriors. And before I did anything to the back tooth, any wax up for the back teeth, I made a stent. So in that case, I'm gonna fill my stent with my bisacryl and seat that in the mouth because I have good posterior stops. On the lower posterior, that's a case where instead I would make a shell. And I would not use a stent to put it in place if I'm wanting to make that shell so that visually I can see I'm getting it right to where I want it to go. If otherwise, if I'm going to use a stent to put the shell in place, then why make the shell? Just fill your stent with this crumb seed in the mouth. So I will use this technique if I'm concerned about a stent that won't position properly. A large case where I push it back down in the second molar area too far and my plane of occlusion is off. Or maybe it's an anterior case where I can't get good, I cannot get good stability with my stent. And I know if I seat my anterior stent with bisacryl in it, it goes too far facial or too far lingual. Well, I can get a shell and see it and visually see that it's in the right place. So the point is, I'm gonna use shells and not use an index to position them because I wanna use my eyes to see that I have it where I want it to be. And then on the upper posterior of this case, 
that is the one where I didn't seed it all the way, you'll remember, and I underseat this, I fill this with bisacryl, or in this case, I was using Luxacrown. I didn't seed it all the way, and I asked the patient to close, and I let the lower provisionals push these up to where I wanted it to be, and that then in turn minimized my amount of occlusal adjustment. Um, and for those uh, that wanted your article in dentistry today, we posted it over in the chat feature, the link to it there. It's okay. Uh, do you think clear uh, vinyl polysiloxane materials would be helpful at all, given that you can cure through them? Um, again, it depends on what you're doing with it. If you're using that to put your bisacryl or material in to make your provisional, then sure, but if we're using it in a shell technique, the advantage of something clear would be you could just see inside of it if you're curing the shell, which would be fine. Um, can it be done with one that's opaque like, like I use here with Luxatemp? And obviously it can because that's what I've always used. So I have no quarrels with, with doing that with clear if that's what you choose to use. Okay. With using a thin shell of flowable composite, how do you prevent the shell fracturing due the, to the hydrostatic pressure from the packable comp composite during seeding? All right, I'm going to get really scientific with you here, okay? So everybody hang on. <laughs> I have no idea, okay? So that's my answer. Um, I would tell you that I fell into this simply through that one case where I was trying to find a solution. And is all I can tell you is that I've had many of these cases, including Steve, and Steve is a big boy that is a heavy, heavy clincher. I don't know if you saw the tour eye on him. He's got master muscles about the size of Rhode Island, and they still have held in place. Um, and I mean, come on, we mix packable and flowable composite all the time. I mean, we all do. So the answer is I have no idea, but I can tell you, I just have not seen separation or breakdown with these at all. I just have not. And, and I'd love to give you some science behind it, but I'm, I'm just not that smart. <laughs> all righty. Uh, do you always leave the provisionals splinted together? No. And so for me, when I'm doing a large case, like you saw earlier um, in this scenario, um, I will do just what I described from the um, global restorative sequence. I do the upper anterior tooth number six to 11 first. I do the lower anterior 22 through 27 next. Those are splinted. I then do here to here, the first premolar to second molar, it is splinted, and then I'm splinted here, and then I splint here and here. If I'm altering vertical dimension, which in this case I did, I section the back molars to leave the second molars individual. Um, and again, without boring you too much, the whole concept of that is that if you've over if you've over, um, if you've opened vertical too much that, and you're having open proximal contacts, I say, where are those provisionals? That could be a sign that they're moving teeth due to opening vertical too much. It's typically not a painful event for the patient at all. It just gives me some clue. So that's what I do with my provisionals, just to give them a little more stability. Um, and so that, that's typically how I do it. And in orthodontic cases, are you splinting? I'd leave that up to my orthodontist. On the um, case where with Steve, that very first case um, here, those are splinted as per the request of the orthodontist. And his thinking was this guy's in his 70s, late 70s actually, and we did orthodontic intrusion, and he was concerned if we did them individually, we'd have a lot of tooth movement. So the good news for me is he wanted them splinted because that's a whole lot easier than doing them individual. 
if I'm doing it for aesthetic reasons, um, I do these. I'm telling you, lower anterior teeth, you're, you're hardly ever going to find me crowning them again. I just, I'm not going to do it much. Um, maybe lower veneers, but these lower composites work so dang good. And so if I was doing these and I, you know, uh, somebody that's 35, 40 years old and I'm doing these composites, I would have these individual. And remember what I said, you've got to get it fitted first as a unit, get it trimmed where it passively goes to where you want. Then from the lingual, I go in with the thin disc, I get it really, really thin, then I snap this apart. If you bond this in place as a single unit and then you try to open your interproximal contacts, I'm just telling you, your interproximal embrasures get too open and they don't look good. Ask me how I know. Okay, do you etch bond or do any treatment to the intaglio of the composite shells? Yes and no. Um, if, if I have done my shell the day that I put it in place and I have got a good clean surface and good clean oral environment to work in, I will go ahead and place my packable composite directly into it. If I am contaminated, if it's been a longer period of time, I will clean the inside out with just a little bit of etch and rinse that. And then I go back with adhesive. I put it in place. I blow that out, right? Thin it. I cure it. Then I add my other composite or bisacryl or whatever it might be. And I use that same technique, whether I'm using Luxacrown, bisacryl, or flowable composite. All righty. Do you use a face bow transfer and a fully adjustable articulator in your overclosure cases? I do not use a fully adjustable. I use a semi-adjustable and um, I use uh, Coyce's Dental Facial Analyzer is what we use. Okay, when you have to increase the vertical dimension of occlusion, how long do you have the patient in provisionals prior to placing the permanent restorations? Uh, let's see what else is in there. Yeah, let's just leave it at that. So there are, there are four reasons that I would consider changing vertical dimension. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a long answer here. One is that from a facial perspective, you're ugly. And I just want to open vertical so you're not so ugly, right? Kind of like, you just... And, and I'm, I'm trying to be funny here, Tim. I'm not talking about you, okay? But you know, the deal. you see some people and just purely from a facial perspective, you sense there would be improvement if you open them vertically. So that, that's one reason. Then there are three dental reasons that I might alter vertical dimension. One is I want to increase in size of ledge length. So if I'm teeth are worn, I can open the bite, which gives me space, and then I can lengthen the tooth. So that's one dental reason. The second is that, that I just don't have room. I've got to open vertical to give me more space. And then the third is that I might want to alter angle of disclusion. And that becomes a huge component, especially in severe wear cases. So I don't know if y'all can see my hands, but you know, if I've got this really deep bite, I open the bite and that allows me to change the lingual contour to where I can diminish or decrease that angle of disclusion. So that can be a, a, a reason why. So at the end of the day, changing vertical, what does that mean? From a joint perspective, not much. Is what research says is that if I've got a healthy joint and I change vertical dimension, typically you're okay. Um, if I've got an unhealthy joint and I alter vertical dimension, I might make that joint worse. However, I might make that joint better because in doing it, you're changing where the condylar head puts the load on the disc and the answer is it depends. So then you ask, so how long do we wait? Well, there's a number of studies that were done and what they looked at was electromyographic activity of the muscles of rest and muscles um, uh, that, that are active muscles. And as what it showed was that when you alter vertical dimension in about 90 days, those muscles go back to their pretreatment muscle activity levels. 
So the test question is, if I'm altering vertical, what's the minimum amount of time I want to have them be going provisionals? The answer is at least three months. I want to test aesthetics. I want to test all the functional aspects. And, and I want to make sure that from the muscular and joint perspective, we're okay. The answer is at least three months. I would tell you that very seldom does it happen that quickly. Um, I, I find usually they're in them for longer for whatever reason. Okay. Uh, I don't think we'll take any questions on coding and that kind of stuff because I, I know you don't know the codes, do you? You know, Tim, I don't. Um, a couple of things. I would tell you that when it comes to, um, well, say these right here, right? For me, this is how I would do it. This would be a mesial distal facial incisal composite because that's pretty much what it's covering on that molar uh, where I did the entire back tooth pre-ortho. Where was she? Um, buh, 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 buh. Well, like right here. I don't know what you'd call it. I'd call it at least an MODL or I would call it a composite core. So those would be for me, that would be how I would code that. Um, so I don't know. I'm no good at that stuff though. I know. I'm not either. I'm sorry about that. I can't help you out. So uh, what bonding materials do you use? What packable composites? Goodness gracious. I, I use aesthetics. Um, and the only reason I've used aesthetics over time is because back in the day, I like the concept of having an opaque, a body and an incisal color where I could layer colors. And again, it just goes back to my porcelain days. And that's, that's what you did. So I liked having composites where I have that benefit where I could layer things with, with the multitude of shades. Um, so that's, that's what I've used. I would tell you that, um, I'm working on another presentation and another technique, Tim, that, you're not aware of, but we're actually, say you're going to do um, six through 11 laminate veneers, where I'm doing composite shells, taking those out, cutting those back, layering in other colors, and then taking that and bonding that on the tooth as more of a permanent restoration, almost a, a veneer, although it's not Obviously, it's not um, lithium bisilicate or anything like that, but it's pretty dang amazing some of the things you can come up with if you'll take the time to play with this stuff, with some of these colors that you can lay stain into and really do some fun things. So I'm just screwing around with that. So we'll, we'll stay tuned. We'll see how that goes. Um, as far as bonding material, um, goodness gracious. Um, my old age is kicking in. Help me here. Um, well, Scotch bond. No, no. I use a, I use a fourth generation. I etch prime and bond. I'm just. Uh, Optibond. Yes. I use Optibond. Goodness gracious. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just, just to solidify some of my thinking here, I, uh, with all this COVID crap going on and, I mean, it, it's just the hassle of it. The, the, I don't sleep, people. I don't know about you. I was up at 2.30 last night. I came out in my garage, and I literally was rewiring part of the car because I can't sleep. And uh, I've got a lady joining my practice this fall, and she's actually buying into the practice next year, and we're supposed to do a seven-year buyout. I called her yesterday, and I said, you know what? Why don't you just buy it all? I'm, I'm quitting. I'm done. <laughs> Man. My, my brain is not where it needs to be. It's just been a stressful time for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, well, hopefully this is taking your mind off that a little bit uh, doing this presentation. Uh, are you pouring up the Siltex stent? I wonder what they're getting at there. Uh, thinking after you do your diagnostic wax and do a, a stent, uh, 
I guess. You so Siltec is a, it's a lab putty mm -hmm. and um, they've got different ones. The bluish purple is the one that I prefer. The green is too hard. The blue purple one is, is just right for me anyway. Um, and the beauty of it is you can put it directly over your model and your wax. So if, uh, but I don't use that to duplicate models or anything. I use that typically just to get that shape so I can then either make my provisional restoration or make my shell overlay inside of that to then make my provisional. Yeah, thank you. Um, lots of questions about uh, occlusal guards uh, to protect the composite buildups. So <laughs> it's really interesting. Um, Kim knows one of the one of the courses I do. It's a two day hands on course on treating the severe wear case. There's no significant magic on this guy as to why he has held up so long. Um, and I'll I'll give you some insight into that right here. Here he is preoperatively. He facially appears to be overclosed. He's got huge tori. Notice he's an anterior crossbite, okay? And clinically, you can see the large tori, and he's got wear back here. So I've done these composites, and I am just flat out telling you the truth. He hasn't broken one of them. And this has been like, I don't know, four years or so, three and a half, four years. Uh, does he have a splint? Yes. Would I prefer for him to have an upper or a lower splint? And the answer is upper. But <clears throat> I don't think any of that's why I've gotten away with it. You know why? I think it all has to do with his parafunctional pattern. Patients that are class three, patients that have cross bites, patients that have anterior open bites, they tend to be very vertical parafunctional people. They tend not to do a lot horizontally. If this guy was a heavy side-to-side -side grinder, I bet these would be torn up in a matter of no time. If these were in my mouth, I think I'd have them destroyed pretty darn quickly. He's an up and down guy. And under compressive loads, these do pretty well. And so that's my grace. Would I want to put a splint in? Absolutely. And he has a splint. He has an upper splint. How come? Let's think about it. If I've got upper and lower teeth, I come together and I grind around. How do our restorative materials hold up under compression? And the answer is really well. How do they hold up under a shear load? No bueno. So if I've got lower teeth and I make a lower splint, I've protected those lower teeth. As I grind around, the force of the splint is against the upper teeth. And guess what? they're still in a shear load. If I make an upper splint, I've housed the incisal and the inclusal of these teeth. The lower teeth come against the splint. As I go protrusive, the lower teeth are in compression. That's good. The upper teeth are housed and they're no longer getting the flaring effect and we stabilize those. So I would tell you that for most of these large cases post-treatment for laminate veneer cases, for these composite cases, an upper splint would typically be the way I would do it. Uh, a number of people asking about adding bisacryl to bisacryl and uh, mentioning they have problems with it separating when they go to adjust the margins. What are your secrets for that? Okay, so here's the deal. Bisacryl against bisacryl. If I'm using a conventional bisacryl, and in this technique, I'm making a shell, right? So I've got a thin shell. I'm going to fill the inside of it with more bisacryl with the rules that we've talked about. If it's been a while, I'm going to clean it. I'm going to put some adhesive on it. I'm going to cure that and then put my other bisacryl in that. I'm going to seed it and I'm going to pull that out. Now, because that's a shell, I've got a reasonable bulk of new bisacryl on the underside. That's going to hold up pretty well. Here's the problem. You take it out and you've got thinner areas or small areas where you've got to add a little. Or you have marginal discrepancies and you've got to add a little. And you go and add more bisacryl there, it's not going to hang on. 
It's not going to do it. So the only way you can make that hang on would be to either add adhesive there, cure it, then add to that. But that's not what I do. If I've got a lot of marginal discrepancies, I'll do my adhesive and then I put flowable composite onto the bisacryl and I cure that to place. And that's the way around it. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, what uh, temporary cement are you using to place the Luxacrown for a pro prolonged period of time? So um, you're going to get some debate from my answer here because part of it depends on what material the final crowns are going to be made out of. And I've tried every stinking temporary cement there is, but the majority of the time we use a really thin layer. And the best way I could describe the thickness would be kind of like toothpaste. And we put about a millimeter to millimeter and a half bead of ZOE BNT around the margin, right at the margin and just up the axial wall. I don't fill it. I'm, I'm literally, if, if my crown is this tall on the underside, I'm filling it maybe to about there. And you seat that and that extra compresses up around there and there's just almost no cleanup. And the majority of the time, that's what we're using. Now, here's the dilemma. If you're bonding a restoration in place, the eugenol is not supposed to be so good. So if I'm doing a restoration that I'm going to bond in place, and I don't want to use that. If I'm doing a lithium disilic crown that I'm going to be cementing in place, I don't mind doing that. So I've got to kind of think ahead to, to say, all right, what, what kind of restoration am I doing? Okay. Uh as somebody's asking you, do you make crown preparation on these teeth? If not, how do these shell overlay provisionals get their retention? So. Do I make crown preparation on the teeth? I think uh, they're asking, um, uh, and I think you showed that where you did the potholes, like in the crowns. Uh, and uh, let's say you're not going to the crown preps yet. You're just building up those posterior surfaces. You're not getting in there and doing a crown prep. You're just kind of bonding to the surface you have. Are you not? Yes. Um, like, it's finding. Where'd you go? Like this? This yeah. is a gold crown. And, um, you know, go, go find your orthodontist. They bond composite to metal all the time. And ask them which system they use. I mean, they put brackets on metal all the time. Yeah. So in this case, it's all I did is I, I made retentive holes into this gold crown. I ran flowable down there and ended up putting a thin layer of flowable over the occlusal that then went down into those holes. Then I put my packable on top of that and seeded that. And again, this, this has been there a long time. If I'm doing something without any preparation, um, so as an example, this premolar, I did prep him some. You can see I did a really large bevel there. Mm -hmm. But yeah. my interproximal contacts, I left intact with his own tooth. Um, so um, as, I'm, I'm just trying to think of another example. In the anterior, would there ever be a time that I don't do tooth preparation? And I guess the answer is, I may not do tooth preparation as long as the additive portion of that overlay is aesthetically where you want it to be. But if I want an overlay in, in a particular location, the tooth's in the way, for whatever reason, you got to get the tooth out of the way. And that's kind of like the prepless veneers. That's great as long as you want the teeth out further than what the tooth really is. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm not sure I'm answering that question, to be honest with you, Tim. Well, I, I think you, you hit the points there. Uh, that some, uh, like, If it's a situation where you're uh, uh, going to be doing crown preps right away, you, you've done your crown prep, you, you, you do your uh, classic uh, uh, provisional, but if it's something that you're, you're just looking at building up the teeth, getting your uh, occlusion and phasing, then you're you're doing you know roughening those surfaces, creating a little bit of space, and using your shell. Right. Yes. 
Okay, how do we fill and trim the interproximals with flowables after seeding? So I very carefully. <laughs> so although you'll be surprised, it's really not quite as difficult as you think. But the answer is, um, let's see if I've got an example. Da, 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 da. And along those lines, how do you get smooth proximal surfaces and margins when using shell overlay technique? Seems like the packable composite would squeeze out interproximally and be difficult to remove and finish. Well, I, I think the difference is that when I use the term, use your eyes, I'm just being really critical. Um, so like when I put this overlay on right here, um, this is the tooth here. I've seated. I get my packable and I'll have my excess before I cure that. I've got a really, really thin interproximal carver. Um, and I go in and I'm taking away any excess and I actually will take away some. So it actually goes up into the Connect an, connection area between the overlay and the tooth. So I leave a little trough. In other words, I don't want to leave anything beyond the tooth. If anything, I'm going to leave a little trough. So I'm just really using my eyes to say, okay, is all of that gone? Um, and so, you know, in this case, like right in here, I'm just having to come in from this lingual with my interproximal carver and just carefully clear that out, come from the facial, carefully clear it out. I may have to go in with an explorer and, and just carefully do that. Um, it, it's just a matter of just really, really, really paying attention. But to be honest with you, I found it just really, it's not that difficult. I mean, it's just a matter of just really honing in on it. After I've removed that excess, so I really don't have any positive packable outside the tooth, it's cured, I go back with my flowable. And so the question is in here, let's say that I've got a trough in here and I'm adding flowable, is what I might do, I may add a mylar in here and kind of inject some flowable in there. I might put some flowable and, and try to get floss and try and clear it with floss a little. You know, it's just a host of different techniques like that. Um, but, but the answer is I might do it with a mylar or something at first to try and hold it and keep it positioned around the tooth and then cure that. But no doubt, it takes some attention. And I will tell you, doing this guy's back teeth, all these upper and lower teeth, that was an entire day appointment for me. I mean, it was eight hours, not including the upper anterior provisional bridge, just his back teeth. Uh, and I, I, I think you would agree, uh, the fact that you're using uh, light cured composite and you're putting these in place, then you're, you're not racing it against time like we do with a, a dual cure uh, cement when we're uh, cementing a porcelain inlay or onlay. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, within reason, obviously. You, you, you'll get light in there and you, you, you do have some limits. But yeah, it's not a, yes, you have time. All righty, uh, do you see any post-operative sensitivity with this technique? No, I really haven't. Um, you know, I, I mean, do I ever have areas of deep decay? If so, I'm gonna do all the things you all would do. I would use some Gluma. I would put a liner over that first. I would then bond over that, you know, if I've got areas of concern. Um, just all the, the typical things we would always do. I have just continued to work with the fourth generation material. Um, I just, I don't know why I, I, you know, if you do talk to, uh, to our main man on materials, uh, Tazir, you know, he, he contends it's still, you know, that's where we get our best um, bond yeah. with, with the fourth generation. However, the fifth are close behind but the sensitivity, um, so I'll etch, I'll use my Gluma, I'll then bond, I, I thin that out, I cure, and um, I often, in many circumstances, I'll put a very thin layer of flowable composite if I have to, cure that, then my packable onto that, 
So it's just different techniques to try and ensure that, you know, we're getting the surface area covered as well as we can. Um, now, do, do we ever have sensitivity? Sure. I mean, with any bonding technique, you can regardless. But, you know, most of these overlay things, you're doing less tooth preparation than if you're doing a conventional filling. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, do you do a CR bite record? Yes. Um, when I do diagnostic study models, we, we do CR bite records, and those models are equilibrated to that. And then my wax up is done to those equilibrated models. And then when I treat the case, we, I typically treat the centric relation. Now, if it's a vertical dimension case where I'm opening vertical, there's really no need to equilibrate because nothing's going to touch. So it'd be a matter of, you know, refining that occlusion once they're provisionalized. But the answer is yes, I do take centric relation bite records. Okay. Question is, how do you take the provisionals out since they are pretty firmly splinted together? And I think they're uh, actually uh, referring to, uh, you know, you get that shrinkage and sometimes it's tough to remove those provisionals. Any tricks? No, not really. Um, is what I do in this case, um, when I'm doing her anterior here, these are splinted six through 11. I'm really looking at all of my preparations to ensure that they draw all of them. Because if this canine's hooking out to here and this bad boy's here, you're not getting them off. And if I've got a scenario where I know that's the case, then I might choose to do three provisionals here and three here. So the point is that I really look closely at my preparations to make sure I get a reasonable line of draw with these. You know the deal with bisacryl, there's a point where you get them off to where you have some grace to get them off, right? Yeah, and absolutely. so I try to find that point and then you let them harden. Then on a case like this, after these have hardened, I've trimmed up my margins, you know, reasonably well. I flip this over, I go in with my diamond burr and I will actually relieve the axial walls on the inside of my provisionals so that these do passively fit up and down. And I do the same thing on my posteriors. Yeah. Okay. That, yeah, that's such an important point. I'm glad you pointed that out. Uh, I'll answer this one for you. What's the brand of disc you use to separate the pieces of the stent? It's a disc from Comet USA. It is. And, and let me tell you, um, we're back in the office tomorrow, and I can't tell you the number, but my girls have it. One of the downsides to these diamond discs with bisacryl, as you know, is they can clog very easily, yeah. and they become a royal pain in the butt. And I've tried everything. I, I keep a, a little um, vat of rubbing alcohol, and you can put them in alcohol, and that helps. However, there's another disc that I found. It's not quite as thick as that really thin one, and it just doesn't clog. Hmm. And that's what I use, and I couldn't tell you the number. My girls can. Tim, is what I'll do tomorrow is when I'm at the office, I'll try to remember to let you know, and you can, you can pass that along to everybody. Beautiful. Yeah. We'll, we'll pass that on in a, one of the upcoming webinars there. You'll have to pick which one and guess. <laughs> All right. Uh, how do you instruct patients regarding oral hygiene with splinted provisionals? Well, I, I don't think I have any of the underside to show you, but I actually trim these on the underside all the way up into here so you can get a floss threader into there very easily. Um, it, it, now, do patients run a floss threader in there? The answer is no. They just don't. <laughs> no, but they don't. Then the next question is, do patients really ever floss in provisionals? The answer is probably not. I would tell you this, that I cannot begin to tell you how many times I get this and this is a train wreck, right? There is no way I'm going to take impressions for final restorations with that. It's not going to happen. 
he's going to get provisionalized first. If you get some great fitting provisionals, and these are splinted together, here he is with them splinted together, you get great fitting provisionals that are splinted together and you take these out, I'm telling you, you give it three weeks and those tissues smile at you. All that inflammation is gone, and now your ability to scan that, it's just a no-brainer. And in the comment I make, heck, if I can do it, then anybody can. And uh, I think that's one of the real reasons to get great provisionals like this that, that allow those tissues. So I just haven't seen it as a problem, but I'm not having these provisionals are not, they're open in here. You know what I'm saying? They're not blocked and huge overhangs. I'm, I'm really being critical about the shapes in there. Yeah. Alrighty, uh, do you do air abrasion before bonding? Oh goodness, I've gone through a time where I did. I'm currently not. Don't ask me why, I've just gone through phases. You know the deal, sometimes if you just really wanna get tissues bleeding well, be sure and air abrade it. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm not, I have, what does it help? Obviously, it improves surface area and, and retention, et cetera. Um, so, yeah. So I have, and I'm, and I currently just haven't been. And our last question is: Have you ever street raced with the 405 Street Outlaws? You know, I don't do drag racing. Um, I do road racing. Um, so I have road raced through actual streets in a race. Um, actually, this is a 120 mile an hour go-kart in uh, Rock Island, Illinois. Um, one of the races I got hauled off in an ambulance because when you hit a barrier doing about 100 going around a corner, you break ribs and it's not a good day. However, I was flying to Vegas to do a thing out there and on the airplane was the 405 guys. They were going out there for, uh, um, Barrett Jackson was out there and they were gonna be going out there. And I tell you, they were really nice guys. They were an absolute hoot. And I mean to tell you, um, I've been, one of the guy's shops is maybe, oh, three to four miles from my house. So I've been over to his shop several times and they've got some serious, serious stuff, man, for sure. Well, Dr. Fling, that's uh, two hours. You did about 40 some minutes of questions. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, I hope everybody enjoyed it. Thanks for having me, Dr. Hess. Oh, you're quite welcome. We look forward to hosting you in our Master Track program this fall. So we'll be doing some of these techniques hands on. Uh, for any of you that are interested in the WAGD Master Track program, here's the information here. And just go to www.washingtonagd.org. Uh, CE credits will be emailed to the address you uh, registered with, the email address. You will receive a email from the AGD uh, sometime after this webinar just stating that uh, you were on that but that's not your actual CE certificate. Your actual CE certificate will come from the University of Washington School of Dentistry CE department. That'll be a PDF that you can just put your name on. You, uh, it, it isn't sent out personalized, but that will work for your CE credits. And remember every one hour of CE uh, time on a webinar, a live webinar counts as one hour of CE. Uh, I'm just going to let this um, PowerPoint uh, roll through here so you can see some of the upcoming speakers. You can use the QR codes to get registered or you can always register at WashingtonAGD.org. Uh, for those of you that would like to share this webinar uh, with a colleague uh, or a staff member, it will be going up on YouTube here within the next four or five hours or so. And you can go to YouTube, Washington Academy of General Dentistry, and just remember to like and subscribe and hit the notification bell. And every time a new webinar is up, you'll be notified. Um, so with that, 
I would just like to say again, thank you, Dr. Fling. We appreciate you coming back and uh, kind of clarifying the shell technique with us. And I just want to say one more time, thank you to all our sponsors, University of Washington School of Dentistry, the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prostodontics, Pierce County Dental Society, Snohomish County Dental Society, Patterson Dental, Comet USA, and of course, the Washington Academy of General Dentistry. This is the WAGD Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE Series. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you on Monday, uh, starting 9.30 in the morning with Dr. Bill Robbins. Have yourself a good weekend, and thank you for supporting the Washington Academy of General Dentistry. Thank you, Dr. Hess. Thank you, Dr. Fling. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Hamamoto. Bye-bye. Hi, Thank to you, the Dr. Plus residents there at the UW. Thanks for joining us today. All righty. Val, I'm going to end the meeting. Good to go. Thank you. Bye-bye.